He's gonna talk about toffee cheese, toffee cheese, toffee cheese. He's gonna talk about toffee cheese, toffee cheese. It's the Chitterbigs. Hey everybody, welcome back to episode two of Titter Pigs. Uh, thank you, first and foremost, for coming back to uh, our second episode. It uh, means a lot to us. Absolutely. You, you, you've, you've made it through the, the, the first one, and since you, if you've come back for the second one, we hope we don't disappoint. Uh, and, and Absolutely. If, and, and if we do, there, it's, it's no fault of our own. It's entirely your horrible taste. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so a um, couple things that uh, we want to cover uh, in our little intro here for you. Uh, first and foremost, what have we been doing since our, uh, our first episode, Scott? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I know both you and I have been very busy with personal lives, work and things have kind of intervened, but uh, gaming-wise, uh, I think since last we spoke, one of the things that both you and I participated in was the Albear and Wizard Staff online uh, games. Oh, heck yeah. Uh, Love the hell out of that event. That was uh, great. It was fantastic, and it, it always is. I mean, if, if you're not familiar with it, definitely you know take a moment next time it comes out, keep your... You know, your Eyes and ears out for it. Sign up for it, and it's or sign up to, to run a game. It's fantastic. Uh, I got to play in a um, a game of of the D sanction run by uh, Paul uh, Baldowski. Baldowski. Oh shit, Paul Baldowski. Baldowski. I'm sorry, Paul, if you're listening to this. If I mess up your name, uh, but but anyways, uh, wonderful game. He is an excellent game master and definitely a great steward for his own game. Uh, def. I back the desanction. Uh, I've read the book. It's a wonderful little light light book. Uh, wonderfully backed. He's come out with a lot of new things and some adventures to come out from a Kickstarter, and had a had some fun. And it kind of falls into, you know, your ballpark a mixture of, you know, fantasy and somewhat historical accuracy. Oh yeah, I I back desanction too. Uh, it. it- I'm actually going to be running it sometime this fall. Mm-hmm. I, I've read it. I've reviewed it on Rolling Box Cars. I'm looking forward to running it. Mm-hmm. I did a poll recently on Twitter. Yeah, maybe a month or so, month and a half ago, mm-hmm. and with a laundry list of games, yep. and that was the game that my Twitter followers said, "Hey, you need to run that this fall." So I'm going to be running the desanction. So v- very much like Liminal did to me when I first experienced it and p- got to play it. The desanction has l- lit a fire in me. So nice. same situation. Hopefully, you know, either do something with one of their adventures, create, create my own, but uh, looking forward to running something, you know, with, within the desanction here in the next, you know, several Fantastic. weeks. Fantastic. So. What else did you play? Uh, that was it to be perfectly honest. Oh, uh, I mean the, the time difference I, in order, oh, yeah. in okay, order for so... me to enjoy an, an evening game over there, uh, within a reasonable time, I'm up at 6am. Yeah. Uh, see, I had to get up at 4am for a 5am start time and I played two games at mm-hmm. Owlbear. And what were so, those? I, my first game at 5am, my time on the East coast U S was root, mm-hmm. uh, run by my buddy Lloyd. So Lloyd, if you're listening, Stellar game, buddy. Mm-hmm. You you knocked it out of the park as always. Root is is a great role playing game. It's it was taken from a board game, uh, converted into a role playing game by Magpie Games. It's hopefully going to be out to backers in print by Christmas. <clears throat> we don't know yet. <laughs> um, sorry, so they're they're busy. Yeah, they're they're busy. They're, with they're a little busy with other things some, these days. Some cartoonish game about you know. Martial arts. I don't know. You may no. It's very something no one's ever heard of. But anyways, yeah. Uh, and then the other game I played was uh, Open Quest, and ah. uh, that was run by our our uh, our friend Doc Griff. Mm-hmm. That was that was a fantastic game. Uh, lots of ducks uh, to be expected, and it was just it was a wonderful game. Yeah, and I loved every minute of it. I loved every minute of both games. Every, all the players were great. The stories were great. The game masters. Mm-hmm. Were, were masters of their craft. It was great. Fantastic. 
And I think other than that, you and I just pretty much were continuing on with our uh, Delta Green Impossible Landscapes game. Yeah, that uh, was my third game that day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and then also continue on, continue on with my um, Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerers game that that I've been, God, it's almost been two years now that that game's been run wow. online. Uh, but we won't go into too much detail outside of that. So, but uh, yeah, so what do we have going into this episode? It is the whole uh, but yes, it is the season uh, of Halloween, Sam Hain, Sawen, wherever you come from, there's a variety of uh, names. Uh, uh, Dios de los Muertos, uh, yes. very popular here. My wife is yes. currently teaching, she does every year teaching her kids to make uh, sh- ceramic sugar skulls. Uh, oh, those are those are beautiful. Those wonderful. Are they turn out so wonderful. The kids are very talented. But yes, so... So, so yes, this is this is the season uh, for all things spooky, gory, horror. So mm-hmm. Scott and I decided that we'd be remiss if we didn't make this episode all about horror. Yeah, horror. I mean, and we're we're within this episode. You know, we're going to give some recommendations of some games that we enjoy that that fall under that uh, uh, that genre. And we also had a fairly, you know, fairly decent discussion where we kind of went around the the table a bit, around the drain, so to speak, on a particular, well, I wouldn't say controversial subject. What would you call it? Um, maybe- controversial is, is, is too harsh a word. It is. But it is... It can be a touchy subject touchy for some subject. people, but I don't, I, don't, I don't say that to put people off. An opinionated subject. I, yes, people have very informed opinions mm-hmm. on this particular topic, right? Uh, as as do Scott and I. Right. So did and did we did we cover it? Yes. Did we solve the question? No. Did we tap toe around it to avoid being yelled at by other people? You betcha. Uh, yeah, but yeah. but we but we did have a, a decent discussion. I th- I think I, I think we, we 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 may have made it a little bit vanilla vanilla, but we're not here to, you know, light a dumpster fire, so to speak. Absolutely not. But we what, what we want to do is we want to stimulate a conversation, a broader conversation from our small conversation. So hopefully, hopefully, when you get to the main segment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you find that uh, we have stimulated some conversation between you and your gamers, your friends, between you and us. Mm-hmm. There, there's that too. So, absolutely. Well, I think there's no time like the present. Let's move on to the main topic. <laughs> All right. Well, we are on to our main topic of this episode. And one of the things that we are going to be dealing with here is the reason for the season horror. <laughs> Horror in RPGs, specifically dealing with agency in horror and dealing with one of the many questions that a lot of people have that's probably been around for as long as RPGs have been around is, can you really truly have a horrific experience in RPGs and retain your character agency within the game? Mm. And it's a sticky subject. And mind you, I'd like to go ahead and Take a moment here and say these are strictly our opinions. This isn't the opinion of myself. This is the opinion of Keith, what we're talking about here. And these are things that we would never hold a candle to anyone else. Nor Correct. would we exactly, nor would we expect them to follow our beliefs and how we feel. And that's also with players. Even though I have a specific opinion, if someone that's at my table has has a difference of opinion, I would not force them into experience something they don't want to. So with that said, we will now move into the specific topic. Keith. Scott. Can can you have a real experience when it comes to horror in an RPG and yet 100... 
I'll even give you a, a 99% allow your players to retain their character agency and yet still have something that follows the definition of horror, which I'm going to just say real quick, and then I'm going to toss it over to your way. So by definition, you know, horror is something that creates feelings of fear, dread, repulsion, terror, in other words, an atmosphere of horror. And what creates these things, at least generally speaking, is the loss or the potential loss of agency. Now I'm going to throw this 500-pound gorilla on you <laughs> and let you go ahead and uh, take it from here. Wow, okay. So, yeah, I got I to gotta lead us into this now, huh? <laughs> Before I answer your question, let me, yep. let me put out a little caveat here. First and foremost, no matter, no matter what, whether it's a horror game or any other game, obviously talk to your players up front um, before you start a game. That way you can avoid potential narrative pitfalls that could be triggering to some players that can ruin a horror game if it delves too far into a reality somebody doesn't want. Oh, for sure. For sure. I mean, this, this is not this is not a hill to die on. No, absolutely um, not. You know, this is, this, you know, I totally agree that, yes, when specifically when it comes to horror games, you definitely want to lay out what's to be expected. And you can do that without without spoiling the, you know, the game. It's just oh, yeah. You. I mean, I, I, I do it quite regularly. Uh, yeah. I hope I'm not spoiling the game for my players, but... But, uh, but, so, but with that, <laughs> but yeah. with that, like back, back to the thing is yep. that, you know, are you... Are you providing for those who are all in? Are you providing them what what some consider to be a genuine horror experience? So I try my best. Uh, it, it is very much atmospheric in and of itself. That's mm-hmm. the atmosphere you provide sets that tone underlying those uh, the niggling sense of dread or fear in the background that something's going to jump out and get you, or you're going to spiral out of you know the situation is going to spiral out of control. But uh, there are games, in Keith's opinion, there are games that do take away player agency, or I should say the character agency. Okay. When it comes to the mechanics of a game and how it facilitates the spiraling or the sense of dread and the spiraling of the downfall of, of a situation. Right. But there are other games that I have played that I actually quite enjoy that in all reality uh, give you give your players 90 plus percent, if not a hundred percent of their character agency and the player in the, in a, in a lot of regards to really create the narrative uh, and work together collaboratively within the narrative without mechanics that take away that agency from, from their characters being able to make certain decisions. Okay. So should we just take a quick second and just just touch on what is your, you know, just in a couple words, whatever, what is your definition of what character agency is? For me, character agency is the characters retain as a character, not the player, but as a character, retain the ability to make in-game decisions for themselves and how they react to situations, how they interact with the situation. Okay. And that's pretty much would be my definition and most okay. people's definition, I would imagine. So I, I, so I would think so. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's never been a disagreement in the RPG world, so I really don't know. No, no, there's never any that. disagreements. I, no, I've never all. heard of one on Twitter. <laughs> uh, uh, and please excuse my dog sparking in the background. There's not much I can do about that. So, but uh, if, if they show up in the in the podcast, they're just co-hosts. Um, speaking of agency. <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but which would you like to reference first? We, we have an understanding of what, what agency is. We have a general understanding of, of what horror is. You, you've said a key word when it comes to, to horror and that's atmosphere. Yes. And you mentioned that you like to set the atmosphere, which leads to, you know, what's going to be a, a key point in, in the game that you're running. Uh, but what is your, I guess... What what would be then your goal if you're running a horror game for for your players? Uh, my goal for my players when I run a horror game is that I create an environment, the ambiance, as it were, that they can experience the game, and knowing that there it, it is a horror game that you know things will spiral out of control. There are going to be potential jump scares. There's going mm-hmm. to be situations. 
in-game stressful situations that their characters are going to have to respond to and react to and interact with. So my goal is to make those as organic as possible, Mm -hmm. but still allowing their characters, again, game itself drives a lot of that, my next statement, allow the characters themselves to make the decisions on how they react to any given situation. Okay. And so, you know, most of us know who are familiar with, you know, with the horror aspect of RPGs, one of the key mechanics that most of them tend to use is either a fear mechanic, and correct me if I'm wrong, or something in regards to some sort of sanity mechanic. Um, I, I would I would generally agree with that. It's it's either called sanity or fear or a pillar of stability or something, but it, it all it's all semi related. Right. Okay. And and so and these things usually are depending on what occurs within the horror game, these things are either subtracted, um, or if they reach a certain threshold, secondary outcomes can occur with the character which leads then i and once again correct me if i'm if i'm missing something or i'm leaving something out which leads then to kind of our main subject of the loss of character agency i Uh, i I would agree Uh, so and once again we're talking from a mechanic point of view but then once we hit that 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 threshold that's where i think a lot of the conversational disagreements or arguments may occur because depending on the game you're playing suddenly once your character passes or meets these thresholds you're no longer in control absolutely uh so a good example of lack of control right Mm -hmm. Uh, any of the games that use specifically sanity mechanics or insanity right Mm -hmm. so the the big drivers on that is call of cthulhu delta green uh, Apoc Thulu, which is kind of a derivative of Delta Green in a lot of senses. Uh, mm-hmm. Any of the uh, horror side or horror facing games of the Gumshoe system, like Trail okay. of Cthulhu, Nice Black Agent, and, and, and different things like that that have a, a either a sanity or some type of pillar that right. a sanity rating of some sort. And when when those situations arise to where you lose sanity. Mm-hmm. That set, like you said, that secondary effect kicks in, and you know that character by the a random roll on a die table, you know, a d10 table mm-hmm. or d6 table or whatever the game is, may say, "Hey, this character needs to run away," or "This character just wet themselves." In in reaction, I mean, I can see, you know, we're kind of chuckling over that, but I mean, yeah. those are some of the reactions, or they have this oh, yeah. this new mania, this new phobia uh, that's going to potentially rear its head from time to time, whether the player likes it or not. Right. Do you think then that when these things occur, that, that, you know, for the, uh, we're just going to call them camp A and camp B. Uh, For camp A who doesn't, doesn't have a problem with it, um, who, or maybe even enjoys it. uh, The, the random aspect of it. Uh, Are they, are they, it seems to me that people who don't have an issue with it, enjoy the randomness they're they're fans of other things within games random tables and you know uh, you know critical failures when these things occur they don't see it as a detriment they enjoy the what's going to happen when we roll that die what's going to happen when i lose when i you know lose five points of sanity and we have to go into the roll on the you know temporary in you know madness table or right or you know or in other games you know if if i'm playing a game of aliens and my marine loses his control is he going to shoot up the station is he going to pull a pin on a th- these are people who who i would imagine you know obviously probably enjoy horror movies because i mean a lot of those those loss of agency when a, when a horror movie makes you jump you're losing agency. I don't care what 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 most people would say. You're you've lost control for a single moment. I, I would uh, I would I would agree with that. So that's Camp A, right? Yeah. So camp B are those folks that want to imparting yeah. my own definition here, but I I, sure. I think you and I are kind of on the same page in terms of definitions. Mm-hmm. Camp B are going to be those folks that uh, want to retain that agency for that character to make the decision when that jump scare does happen, how do they react? Right. 
when they encounter a very stressful situation where they are forced to to lose some sanity points or its equivalent in whatever the game is, mm-hmm. how is it that that character reacts to the situation instead of being told how they react to it? Okay, uh, is that a fair? That, that's 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 fair, and I, I it, it it's almost like can't be is actually would be divided into two. Could there, be. There's, there's there's what you described, and then there's people who just don't like losing character agency at all. Doesn't have to be horror, right. and you know, gr- and granted, most of the most of those would probably avoid playing a horror game just because they know what what the situation is going to be. But then there are the part A who want to play in a horror game, but still want to retain, like you said full agency of their character as these things unfold before them during right. the game. So for you, when you're running a game, right, Scott, mm-hmm. what type of games do you like to run? Whether, you know, the players would fall into camp A, camp B, or, you know, B and a half. Um, mm-hmm. You know, what, what type of games is it you like to run? And then do those games, in your opinion take away some or all of that character agency or do you think those games that you particularly like allow character to retain that i'll, I'll give two and uh, one one probably gives a little bit of it although it's you're not necessarily retaining you know your character agency you're kind of deciding what the maybe the lesser of two situations, but you have an opportunity to um, cushion it to Delta green. Okay. Delta green. Delta green is, is a fantastic game on so many levels when, when dealing with not just horror, but other things within the scope of, you know, of, of humanity uh, that's different than other, like, you know, blah 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 you know dracula and and, you know your typical hammer horror you know things or other aliens but what it does it retains a lot of the same uh sanity mechanics that you get with call of cthulhu although it does give you a buffer that allows you to avoid losing agency but then again you are forcing this agency that you're gaining onto NPCs within the game. Meaning, okay. you know, in order to totally ignore this cosmic horror that you witnessed, you are buffering it by coming home and taking it out on your wife by completing shutting yourself out from from your partner or whatever. And within the game mechanics mean is you're um uh you're you're utilizing a bond. And but anytime you use a bond to offset this loss of agency, your relationship with that bond decreases and to the point where they eventually leave. And I agree with you because I do like Delta Green myself. Mm-hmm. But do you think that the deflection of that situation onto the bond mm-hmm. still allows the character in game to retain that agency in terms of how they how the effect of mentally shifting the situation they're currently in mm-hmm. onto a bond which then gets resolved later mm-hmm. do you do you think players retain that the agency and the decision making on how that plays out with no. the bond no I, I i i mean realistically speaking i don't and but then again that falls into this into the conversation of i me personally i don't have a problem with that but but what it does is it it does give does give you a little bit more of an option than just rolling on a random sanity table once you go below a certain amount of points or so something so to speak there there That's are fair. other ways to maintain the ultimate character agency and that's keeping your character in the game um you know so okay that's, i i that- I can't disagree with that. I mean, that, that is good logic. Uh, I would I would add a counterpoint, though. Again, yeah. uh, as as it relates to Delta Green and, and mm-hmm. pushing those those situations off onto bonds that are later resolved, like kind of mm-hmm. off camera of sorts, mm-hmm. out of the main out of the main of the game itself. I think it falls to the game master, the handler, at that time, how that gets resolved. Right. The handler could say, "Okay, you've returned home." You've pushed this on, you know, you've deflected those situations onto the your bond with your children. 
Mm-hmm. How does that play out? What does that look like if it was just a camera looking in at your life outside of the 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 mission you were on, the operation you were on? Right. How does that look to the camera and to the to an audience watching from afar? Then the player retains that, and and the and the character and player retain mm-hmm. that um, narrative element to decide how that looks. And how that plays out to account for that loss of, you know, that bond starting to dwindle right. down. Yeah. But a keeper could also just go, okay, cool. You've uh, you've come home, locked yourself in your study, and you are not going to your kids' little league games or softball games or band practices or mm-hmm. or whatever it is. You know, your children don't want to have anything to do with you in your home because they think you're aloof and you're distant and yeah. that you don't love them. Yeah. And the and the handler could just tell you that. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it, it could, that's a player handler relationship. Right. And it can be, it can be, but the thing with Delta Green, you're still dealing with a horror game and it could be as vanilla or as horrific as you and the, well, I should say you, the other players and the handler are comfortable sure. with. Sure. Um, and that, that also throws in a different dynamic where usually it's up to the, the game master to maintain that kind of integrity because but then again with with horror games you know especially in games like delta green where you actually can contribute to the horror with things like bonds someone can go really off the deep end into something that's going to make someone else completely uncomfortable and that goes back to my conversation earlier at the beginning right. of this um right. discussion about Converse, yeah everybody talking up front about you know, right. You know, are, are you, are you, like you said, are you going to go home, lock yourself away and uh, just ignore your children or are you going to come home and you're going to get drunk and, and beat your wife, you know? And, and, yeah. and, and as horrible as that is, and as no one wants that to happen correct, with, within the dramatic aspect of a game or even in the, the aspect of horror in general, these things do are portrayed in realms of entertainment but once again, you don't want to, you know, your person sitting next to you who has dealt with a violent relationship having to, who, you know, has totally been looking at the the keeper to avoid things like that, doesn't realize right. that, oh shit, I've got to keep an eye on the players too. Right. But, but I, I'm, I digress from that. So the, the aspect of, yes, d- does, does the addition of being able to waylay or avoid the aspects of horror and terror within a horror RPG with things such, such as Bond maintain the agency with, with, within a horror game? No, I, I don't think it. And, but of course, this is coming from a person who is still kind of has the ultimate question is, without these, this loss of agency, are we really having a, a horror game? You know, are, is there, is, are there ways that you can have a, you know, in horror RPG experience and so I yes. think I have an answer for you on it. I think okay. I, I really think I do. But before I get to that, mm-hmm. what was I know you said you were going to highlight oh, two. two games. So okay. what what is your second game? So two, as far as as that I like to that I run is Mothership. Okay, and I now I know quite a few people ha, are f- somewhat familiar with it. I mean, Mothership has been very popular for um, a couple years now, and. You know, it's it's a for those who don't know Mothership, it's essentially it's you know it's like running an Aliens RPG, um, not the specific Aliens RPG itself, but an Aliens like. I concur. There's, me- there's mechanics in that game, much like within the Aliens movie and such, such as that. That you know, the loss of agency, depending on what happens within that game, can be a very slow burn, or shit can go south. In a few minutes, depending on. Oh yeah, I oh on, I know f- from firsthand experience, absolutely. Right, because of the because of how interconnected it is within the mechanics that if a particular uh, character loses something, whether it be you know fear, or they do something incorrect, that it creates the spiral effect, and it's one of those things where um, the the spiral effect ends up being. N- Probably not necessarily more horrific, but it's it, it, it could be very. Um, oh, I mean, there's uh, we all know there's different types of horrors, but this this right. is this is just a horribly violent scenario. Uh, you know, a, a marine can suddenly lose their character agency 
and end up blowing up the, sp- the space station that they're on or shooting other people. Uh, the an, an android, uh, you know, within that game is going to make other people uncomfortable that if they if they lose a specific role, they're going to lose more of the sanity mechanic in that game. Uh, you know, and and but and, and it affects and there's there's mechanics in there that ends up affecting a lot of people within it. And to me, it is probably one of the most clear cut examples of there's no agency within this game. To be perfectly honest, once okay, it hits I was certain, just about to yeah, ask. Once it hits a certain point, at a certain point, the agency that you have is trying not to lose more uh, agency. Because at a certain point, I mean, the, the ultimate is just you have a heart attack and keel over and die. Right. Uh, so when these when these horrific incidents occur, mm-hmm. do the players just for clarity's sake, do the players retain? the decision-making and the narrative prowess to say, this is how my character reacts, or does the game master just tell them either narratively or based on a random role? It's if you, if you're doing it as the rules are, or, you know, as the rules suggested, suggested it's based on a random rolls. I mean, so okay. it's, a, it's a random rolling table. Uh, there are certain things within the mechanics that can subtract the higher the roll, the worse the outcome. So there's certain yeah. things that I mean, can increase yeah. it or decrease it, but but still, it's you roll a dice and you can add to it. But there, if you roll that heart attack, there's no avoiding it. You know, right. There's, there's, so at, in essence, though, what you're saying is, mm-hmm. me as a player, or anybody else as a player, whenever that horrific situation occurs, and this has to be determined. The outcome of that situation, how my how my marine or android reacts to it, is based mm-hmm. on a on a random roll on a table, like like the sanity uh, tables, bouts of madness, or right. um, you know the effects of insanity in Call of Cthulhu. It's no different mm-hmm. in that regard. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's 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 no different, but but unlike some of the other games like Call of Cthulhu. No, I mean, no one, unless it's just a horribly written game, is going to lose all of their sanity, with, which in the first 30 minutes and end up pulling the pin on a grenade and blowing everyone up. Oh, that's but good. that But that has happened in Mothership, you know, more more. <laughs> that is more true. Than I've, I've witnessed that. I've played Mothership, so. Yeah, and due to no, you know, manipulation from, from myself or others, it's just how things went down, depending on the choices right. of, of the players, but... At a certain point, you you do end up the players. The only thing that they're doing at a certain point is chasing their tails to avoid the worst outcome. Now, people, there's people out there who love that about the game. You know, there's the and, and but they treat it as such. No, the, the, there's people who look at Mothership and go, "I'm not going to run a year long campaign with this." That's yeah, it's insane. definitely Camp A kind of people. <laughs> yeah, they want wow. to just have things go batshit balls to the wall. It's like within, playing Fiasco, right? With Within three to four hours, and, <laughs> right, right, yeah, and everyone expects things to, you know, no one expects to survive. Uh, Agreed, but uh, but that's that's that once again that's a communication of the GM who's handling the game, telling people this because I and I'm sure you've been the victim of I shouldn't say victim you've been a witness to this also of where you've run a game, and maybe you weren't, crisp, you know, crystal clear on what to expect, and there's that one person who's like. I'm dead already, or, or yeah, I'm I've gone insane. Been there, done that. Got the coffee cup and T-shirt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So all right, so let me so to counterpoint this, right? Let me let okay. me throw out two two specific games in mm-hmm. in short and brief okay. that I think having run both of them several times allow those players to retain ninety plus percent of uh, of their characters' agency within the game to to make decisions and reactions. Okay. So the first would be Ten Candles, okay, a small little indie published game, no joke, 100% player driven. The game master is really just sitting there to say, you need to make a dice roll whenever a character who has kind of got the spotlight on them at the time Mm -hmm. decides they want to do something. Let me preface the rest of this by the players themselves get a little framework in which to play. Okay. And that sets the the atmosphere. And then beyond that, they are pretty much 100% in control of the narrative. They can decide what it is they are doing, how they are doing it, how they react to things. 
But when they want to do certain things, and I say certain things, pretty much any time that a uh, a situation arises in which the outcome of a situation mm-hmm. is unknown. Like I'm gonna kick in a door. I don't know. I don't know that there's zombies behind the door, but I'm gonna kick in that door because we're trying to get out of here, right? Right. Okay. So, okay, cool. You get to kick in the door. Not a problem. You said you're gonna kick in the door. You're gonna kick in the door. Now I'm gonna have you roll the dice. It's a it's a d6 dice pool system. You roll the dice, and depending on how the dice work out, you really just need one six to succeed. Mm-hmm. Ones remove dice from your dice pool till the end of the scene, and if you get no sixes, uh, you have the choice as a character and as a player, you can burn some some things on index cards mm-hmm. uh, to get re-rolls and different things like that. Or you can just let the, let the scene come to an end and a candle goes out. And the candles, because you play with 10 of them, those right. are the tension mechanic baked into the game. As the candles go out, the lights get dimmer and dimmer because you should be playing physically in, in a dark okay. space with just these 10 tea light candles <clears> lit. <throat> and as as you fail these dice rolls and you choose not to do something that initiates a re-roll, you snuff out a candle, the scene ends. There's a little kind of like uh, sequence or mantra you go through. Right. And then the next player to your would be to your left becomes the spotlight player and they pick up wherever the next scene starts from. Okay. But the players decide where where the next scene starts from, how their character and player respond to that spiraling situation where they didn't. But where I said, you know, these games, you know, 90% plus. So where the game master kicks in in this game is as the players lose dice from their dice pool, from those ones, um, they're, they're removed out of the game. But as the number of candles diminishes, those because the dice are equal to the number of candles that the players have. Okay. So if there's only six candles lit, the other four dice that are no longer available to them become available to the game master. And then the game master is rolling against them every time there's a situation where the dice need to be rolled mm-hmm. for who has narrative control. Hmm. It, it's a very interesting mechanic. It doesn't allow them to have 100%. But if they said, let's let's just say in the situation... I was rolling two dice, you were rolling eight dice, I got a six, you got no sixes. Right. The candle's going to get snuffed out, and I and I get to dictate, not dictate, but I get to narrate how that scene comes to an end. Because okay. you've decided not to do something to re-roll. Okay? So I would narrate how that scene comes to an end in line with what, it, what action you were doing. So you still, as a character you still have that thing happening you're kicking down the door you were hoping there was no zombies there but guess what there's three zombies behind that door waiting for you right or you walk into the room and you know suddenly there's someone behind you or you know right so it's it's kind of that camp like b.5 b and a half yeah yeah um but at the same time if you happen to roll two successes two sixes and i rolled one you get to it the outcome is what you wanted still, mm-hmm. but you get to narrate what it looks like to like a to an audience watching. Okay, you know you get to say we bust down that I bust down that door, and when we thought we had heard those zombies on the backside, nope, they are not there. But we can see where their trail of blood and ichor have have okay. scooted off elsewhere and and chases some other quarry. Right. Okay. You know? So I mean it it. it I've never played it. I'm aware of it. I've seen oh, it. It's a great game. I've it's seen absolutely it a great game. But it, and it, it does sound like a great way to experience a very cinematic, uh, you know, once again, and the storytelling aspect of the RPGs, you know, that's I'm not going to cover that at, in, in any sort right. of a, uh, exacting definition right now. But, but, you know, the collaborative aspect of that as, you know, you've got a group of people who are creating a horror story or other things I can imagine can be used yep. for not just horror. Very tense atmosphere. Oh, my God. Is very it important. Uh, but, you know, but once again, the, you know, does it does it fall? That's the big question, which, you know, we'll, we'll end with with that whenever we get to the point. But I mean, do, does that fall under the definition of what what? 
horror should be. You right. know, it, it, you know, the fact that, you know, that it you're, you're, it's either a win or lose, you know, whereas in other aspects, the horror, you know, once you experience the horror, you're not ending your game. Right. You're, you're still trying to survive through it. So, right. yeah, I mean, and we're branching off to reteach. I know, I know. This this but, could be a 10-hour conversation. But, but, uh, so let me okay, throw out my so, second game. Yes, throw out your second. So my second game is A Town Called Malice. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nordic horror in its themes, right? Okay. And it allows for some collaborative building as players up front, what your town looks like. But every town has a body that's found. Every town has this thing that needs to happen. Floodwaters rising, you know, monster lives in water kind of situation. And everybody going into the game agrees that as players, they agree that, hey, we are going to do things to try to make this event happen, like the water rising or whatever this horrific thing is going to be. Right. uh, As a atmospheric bit, right? Mm -hmm. But the players and through the players, their characters retain nearly 100% of their agency. Okay. They get to decide when they when they as a character are a spotlight, they're they're the main character for that scene. They get to decide where that scene takes place in town, who's involved in it, and then the other characters take on temporary roles as like the NPCs in that scene if they're not directly playing in that scene as a character, okay. as their character. And then they play out the scene till it feels like it comes to its natural conclusion. But And then the scene ends. Mm-hmm. And then the next player becomes a spotlight player. But there are dice that are rolled at the end of each scene. And there are three pillars in the game. It uses this pi- uh, system called the pillar system. Mm-hmm. There's the body. There's the darkness. It's kind of this looming horror that's rising. And then the event, um, which is like, in my example there, like the floodwaters are going to rise. Right. And, but every scene ends with a die roll and depending on, on how that die roll ends up, that's the player now gets to move dice, uh, from add dice or move dice from those three different pillar cards that are laid out in the middle of the table. Mm -hmm. And that drives the tension. Okay. Because this, when things have, when more things have dice on them, when we get to like, uh, the middle, like the intermission between the two, you know, act one and act two, mm-hmm. um, like in fiasco, it's like a tilt tables rolled right? to determine how the next act has spiraled out of control in that intermission. And then the characters are now deeper into this mess, generally a nightmare, Right? how okay. they, you know, the, the framework in which they get to set their scenes so the players and the characters still retain that agency in making those decisions. So I think those are two of my personal examples from games that I've played that are counterpoints to, you know, Mothership and Delta Green and Call of Cthulhu, those very more traditional style right. of mechanical aspects. Right. Okay. I mean, I, I definitely, a, it would fall under the general aspect of of the genre with without question sure uh but it's still i know it, it's it's still kind of doesn't 100 percent answer you know it, it, it's it there's there's a lot of aspects within that and, and same thing you know wh- when it comes to like delta green and, and call of cthulhu it's up in the air I, right it's just the the and I know it's the individual experience of a person. That's why some people don't play horror games. That's why some people don't play fantasy. They just don't like what it provides or what. Right. But no, and I, mean, I think I think you I think you hit on something. It's mm-hmm. it's the game. It's the person, and there is no clear cut definition of player agency, right? Character agency. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I still think uh, all of this goes back to. Setting it up at the beginning when everybody at the table, the the game master and all of the players have a conversation. Right. Uh, whether it's uh, lines and veils, use of X card. Mm-hmm. Hey, these are the things that are, you know, this story has these elements. Mm-hmm. If these elements, I'm not going to tell you what they are specifically because I don't want to ruin any of the game. But if right. these types of elements 
are things that you have issues with, mm-hmm. then you know, please tell me as a game master, tell me and right. I'll either rescript things or dial it down. But you but you wouldn't have that option in in part of the two of the examples that you gave because you're relying on the creativity of the other players that you're with to maintain. Uh, that, um, I would no, I would argue you actually have it and then some because if you have that conversation up mm-hmm. front, where you work the players, the group playing works right. up front and says, okay, I don't want you know spousal abuse in the game, and I don't want harm oh. of animals in the game. Oh no, I'm not talking about aspects of that. I'm talking okay. about okay. I'm, talk- I'm talking about like you know your friend Bob. You know, and, and, you know, Bob's a, a good guy and he's, you know, he, he knows his fantasy well, but, but Bob doesn't know shit about horror. In, in fact, well, then there's that, yeah. you know, and, and, and in fact, you know, Bob, Bob is going to make it, you know, turn it into a joke because he doesn't really know how to apply that. Whereas if it's being run by the game itself with the utilization of things like, you know, loss of player agency with sanity mechanics and things like that that may at least give you know bob a uh, a platform to work with uh so so yeah i mean it, it's and that's i know that's kind of an extreme example but once again you know it's it's either it's either you have to have some something like that or you just don't invite bob because bob can be an asshole right so again i think we go back uh and and maybe you can agree with me or we might have to agree to disagree a little bit um that there is no clear cut on any of this i mean Mm -hmm. i can run a game have you as a player and if you're not into like super techno mecha horror and i am you're not going to necessarily know how to react right narratively speaking and I, th- I think we've done a fairly good job of circling the question without kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of like answering ourselves because I think what we were hoping to do was, you know, what do our listeners think? Right. 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 So, okay. So let, let me throw this out there. Um, mm-hmm. We've got another segment coming behind this that I think you guys are going to like, but in addition to that, I'm going to put out a challenge to everybody. Head over to anchor.fm slash titterpigs. Go to our website where we host uh, over on Anchor. There's a button where you can record a message. You can record us a short message and tell us what you think player agency in a horror game is to you. And again, right. and maybe a game that really embodies that right. or doesn't embody that. Tell us tell us what you think. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you feel that you can have – can you have a real hor- horrific experience in an RPG with or without, you know, is your, are you, you know, do you think you can? Do you think you can? And definitely, if you do, give us an example, though, because that's, yes, that's please. the other thing. We are, we please are, give us examples. We are a game, we are an RPG gaming site, and we definitely want to point, point people in the right direction, uh, you know, lead them to things that they're interested in and what, they, what they're looking for. That's one of the big points of, of this is to, to promote gaming and, you know, not make it something that is strictly, um, you know, centrally focus on something, you know, right. There's something for everyone, even if they're not aware of it, maybe they might find out now. So, so yeah. So, so, so yeah. Am I right? And and is Keith wrong or is Keith wrong? And I'm right. I think that's what we're trying to get on with. Yeah. Tell it, tell us who's right, who's (laughs) wrong, or if neither of us are right and we're both just morons. That's cool too. Um, Is is this a subject we shouldn't even be talking about? Probably Uh, is, but you know what? uh, We're titter pigs. So this is what we talk about. Yeah. Uh, So what we'll do is Scott and I will listen to everything that uh, everybody submits via the uh, recorded message and we'll curate a few of the kind of the, the, maybe differing opinions or, mm-hmm. and we'll, we'll curate a few and we'll put them in uh, on the tail end of our, uh, our November episode, you know, episode yep. three, mm-hmm. you can become internet famous like us too. Yeah. So with that, I think we are heading on to our next segment. Ladies. 
Ladies and gentlemen, good folk of the Podverse, step right up. We're going to amaze, stupefy, and titillate your senses with our horror game recommendations. Scott and I are going to quickly bounce back and forth with our Titter Pig recommendos. It's going to be like a speed run on Halloween for candy. Scott. So yeah, um, you know... Like like a lot of things in in the role playing game world, there are go tos. There are the the gorillas in the room that kind of hold everyone's attention, whether you know you're new to the gaming world or you know you're well entrenched in it. Uh, there is probably there is the most popular horror game currently out there that's been holding that title for a long time. But like with with most things, you know, even even if you run the gambit and still enjoy it, you like most people like to look elsewhere. And these games that we have are going to be our suggestions. You know, merely suggestions that uh, that we think would make good. But they're so good. I know, and, and but it's you know our reasons for liking them may not be the reasons other people like them, but they're definitely we feel they're worth checking out for whatever our our case may be, whatever we plead. So. With that, uh, since Keith handed me the, uh, uh, the the torch, I shall begin with my first recommendation. Now, this may not be your traditional horror game. Uh, um, in fact, to be perfectly honest, most most of mine aren't going to be traditional. They're going to have horror aspects to it, uh, but not really ones. Maybe one that you would definitely think of. It's like, is this fall strictly under the horror category? And but my first one is it's going to be what is. Um, what is currently called Weird Frontiers uh, used to be called Dark Trails, and this is this is a game by uh, David Beatty uh, from Stiff Whiskers Press that was kickstarted before the pandemic, to be perfectly honest, and has been in production for quite some time. But uh, like a lot of like, like a lot of good things, uh, you know, come to those who wait. Uh, this is definitely one of them. Uh, we haven't received it yet, but we we have seen it in all its PDF glory of 800 plus pages. Of a, oh, it's massive. Of a self-contained game. But what it is, it is a it is a Dungeon Call Classics game. It utilizes the Dungeon Call Classics rule set. And for first off, for those who are familiar with it, there you go. You don't have to learn something new, which is a plus when it comes to recommending new games. But uh, it does have its own fear mechanic built in. It just does utilize a hex and a boon system, similar to like a bane and boon system within the game. Uh, there's a sliding morality, and there's not really an, an alignment within the game that has much effect, but uh, you kind of slide back and forth between are you a shining cowboy in, in, a, in a white or in a bright white hat, you know, or are you a, you know, dressed all in black as a leather gunslinger, you know, with a toothpick in the corner of your mouth. That makes it different than your standard Western is it is a mix of Weird West, uh, very similar to Deadlands, uh, you know, not going to lie, it is definitely one of those that is a Deadlands type game. But where Deadlands, I'll concur. Yeah, yeah. But but where Deadlands <laughs> has its own kind of horror horror kind of setting built into it uh, that's specific to it. This one is different in that it utilizes more of a Cthulian horror mythos uh, within its game and very brutal to be honest. Uh, the games that, that I've played outside of uh, you know a lot of the ones that uh, that have been presented to uh, to us before the completion of the game have a sliding scale like all horror games do um some ha- kind of touch on the outer perimeter others are full-blown cthulhu madness games that make it a, a wonderful setting if, if you're looking to to kind of have one foot in the weird west of you know the wild wild west and deal with like you know the crazy doctors and the uh you know building crazy steam punky machines and gunslingers flinging magical cards at you but still have this outlying fear and horror just on the perimeter this is a definite game for you to check out. And likewise, if you're a DCC freak like I am, this is a no-brainer. Go check it out. Go pick it up. And there's there's a free quick start still, I believe, but uh, the game itself, worth getting without without even looking at it. You, 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 oh, I concur. I've played it. I concur. You, you have my solemn guarantee that, that if, you, if you pick up that game and you end up not liking it, that I'm not going to give you a refund or anything, but I'll apologize formally. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> Uh, so, nice. so back. <laughs> nice. Okay. So t- tossing, tossing that, uh, that weird West, uh, shotgun your way now. All right. Well, I'm going to take it a little bit different direction. It's not going to be quite weird West, but it's going to be good for trick or treating. Cause I like to go trick or treating in a little town called malice smooth. <laughs> oh yeah. You like that, huh? Uh, this is written by, uh, David Kizia of monkey fun studios. <laughs> and this is a game stylized on, uh, Nordic horror. Uh, with taking inspiration from 
all kinds of crazy TV shows like Twin Peaks and, and things like that. But what really what really sets this game apart for me as a go-to horror game outside of the mainstream kind of things is it's really a player-driven game. And if, if, we, if we haven't noticed, this is the second time I've referenced this game tonight in this podcast. It's player-driven, uh, and the players drive all the controls and aspects of the game, which I really like. So the players build the town. Players build the NPCs as part of game prep and game play. When a spotlight player needs to have an interaction with an NPC, another player plays the NPC. Mm-hmm. It's great. Uh, so it's it's really all about building this narrative and everybody works together. It uses a system, a game engine called the Story Pillar System. It uses three uh, pillars, uh, one called the body, the event, and the darkness. And uh, at the end of each scene, dice are rolled, dice move between these different things based on a matrix and uh, but players still have control of this stuff but everybody is working to pursue the same three objectives in the game which is fantastic too is they're trying to investigate investigate the questions surrounding why there was this body found in this town this town of malice Mm -hmm. to try they're all collectively trying to defeat the growing darkness while at the same time they're all working to support and encourage whatever this scheduled event is so as a collaborative game, it's really good, and it's a shared narrative, but it, it has these kind of weird undertones of horror, but it can be horror, it can be a little far-fetched horror, it, you know, it can border kind of on aliens, it can border on, you know, Cthulian mythos, okay. I mean, it could, it could go, it, it could be jump scare stuff. It's modifiable, it go a lot of different depending ways. on the, oh, absolutely. depending on the horror trope you're trying to portray, you can't Oh yeah, it. there's, there's a couple of add-on scenarios for mm-hmm. it, uh, that came, uh, they're available as PDFs and that I got with the Kickstarter a couple, couple of years back. Right. Uh, I think one, if I remember right, is, uh, Colonial America, okay. um, kind of a witch theme. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's very adaptable and very versatile in that regard. Okay. So it's super fun, really inexpensive. It's just a small digest size soft cover book. Mm-hmm. It's all in that. Everything you need to play is there. You just need some pencils, some index cards, and some D6s. I it's great. I think it's on my shelf. I, it's one of those where it's been there for a while, and I, I need to take it down and, and definitely look yeah, at it. Yeah, and the game travels well. I throw it in my backpack when I travel. So, yeah. um, All right, I'm going to punt it back over to you. As you probably can tell just by looking at me that I am a, a man of a certain age, um and i i yeah because they can see you through the uh through their earbuds i'm talking to you jackass oh uh, <laughs> oh did you just call me a dingus uh well a different word but yes uh oh, okay. but but anyways um yeah so and with that you know we you know you and i have went through a certain period of our lives called the 80s um, Ooh, that was horrific. I know, I know. Well, it, but I loved it. it. It it was horrific for those who actually lived through it. But those who like to watch it on TV seems it was this magical neon time where you know kids can do whatever they want and get in trouble and survive. To, to that's false news. I, it, 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 well, it, it is. But 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 the the <laughs> but with that there wasn't a lot to do in the eighties. And so yes, as we were kids, we did tend to get in trouble or just do things to keep us occupied. And um, so there's a certain, you know, familiarity with things like Stranger Things and whatnot. And so coming up on the, you know, into as we're starting to hit the beginning of going into our midlife, um, nostalgia hits us hard. And there's nothing more nostalgic than remembering what it was like to be a kid. And with that comes a game that I'm going to suggest called Dark Places and Demogorgons uh, by Eric Bloat and Company. This is from Bloat Games. And immediately before anyone who's never heard of this game says anything, yeah, it, it is it is a, a a blatant take from the popularity of Stranger Things, and that's worn <laughs> that's worn on its sleeve. I mean, it, and, you know, Bloat, Bloat's a definitely a, a great guy, and Eric would be the first to admit it that you know he's not going to go. Well, what do you mean? I, I made this before it came out. No, he definitely has ridden the wave of of this nostalgia as have a lot of other companies exactly too, so. let's let's be fair about exactly that. things from the flood i mean as beautiful as a game that is that's falls into the same category so but uh it is a this one really hits hard with the 80s nostalgia and the and the movies we grew up with uh around that time you know goonies um uh lost boys all the things that stranger things you know kind of touched upon itself 
you're essentially your player character, your child in either your early teens up to, I believe it's 18 is the oldest they really want you to go at least within this part of the game. Very similar to things from the flood kind of thing, but um, it takes place, you know, in 80s America, so to speak. Uh, more centralized is his uh, setting, which is, uh, you know, Southern Kentucky. And what's very wonderful about that is, is he uses real life settings and, and, and areas within here or within there and elsewhere with that throughout the United States and kind of incorporates a lot of the local uh, folklore. Uh, around there and and, and nice. it exists i mean this is, exists all around the country for those familiar with it you know america has a very rich folklore setting not not as diverse as you know europe because we haven't been around as long but we still have all the crazy stuff localized to in every state got its local you know folklore you know whatever but uh but it's the it does it's the similar thing you are either a particular trophy child of the 80s um and you see things that other people don't and you, uh, you know, it's your job because the adults won't listen, you know, and it's, it, and, but it's a very easy system. It utilizes the, uh, I believe it uses, utilizes the D&D OGL. So it's, once again, it's another familiar set of rules that uh, you can pretty much pick up, read through it and take off. But the other thing I like about it is, is it, it's, is his passion, uh, one of his passion games because it is well supported uh, outside of the, the, the book itself. It rolls into different tropes and themes with, with vampires and ghosts. And uh, recently, uh, he had an entry called that uh, that's focuses specifically on an area that I'm intimately familiar with, and that's Northern California in the Lost Boy setting, uh, where he's kind of taken nice. that and made it an entire setting book. And every time he comes out with a new book, there's there's new information, new character tropes. So, And it's one of those things where it's also modifiable. You know, so you can definitely pick up whatever he's created, put it in your local t- hometown, and suddenly your city of Eastvale, California, has become, you know, uh, Oddsville, USA. Uh, See, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, and it, and it's and and I and it's and I know some people know about it, and uh, I just don't know if it, it if how many people know about it outside of kind of like the small American OSR community, but. Um, it's an excellent game, and and, and it's once again just because it's centralized in the in the United States doesn't mean it can't be picked up and moved anywhere. Because as much I was like to think that our '80s experience was singular uh, to us, coming to find out through the past year and a half, even talking to everyone, everybody had horrible fashion sense throughout the '80s, not just me. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> not just you, not just me. Everybody so, did, and and a lot of hairspray. Uh, but yeah, so, so that, that's, that's Dark Places and Demogorgons, uh, by Bloat Games. You can pick it up on drive through, or I believe he also has a storefront also. All right. So, uh, let's go ahead and, and, uh, hand over that Rubik's Cube to you. See what I did there? Wow. Okay. So I'm going to keep with the same theme mm-hmm. of, uh, hairspray, bad, ugly clothes, mm-hmm. and strange hometowns. And I'm going to go, my recommendation now is going to be Kids on Bikes. Okay. Okay, not expressly a horror game, mm-hmm. but it is the, like, in terms of adaptability, it's kind of like an Apex game. It is so adaptable, you could, uh, you can reskin it as horror, you can reskin it to do Scooby-Doo-esque kind of games, you know, um, you could do Ghostbusters with it, you know, I mean, you, you can run the gamut with this thing, it has super simple rules uh, that apply an appeal i should say appeal not apply appeal to a broad audience mm-hmm. and on top of that uh where it lacks specific horror mechanics it does make up for it in in other areas so it doesn't have like a sanity mechanic or a fear mechanic that some of the more traditional games have but it does have like a flight stat right fight or flight mm-hmm. so you could be dealing with a situation a ghost and you're playing a 10 year old kid or a 15 year old kid or a 19 year old and you're dealing with a horrific situation or a ghost or something and you know you have to decide do I want to stay or do I want to run I don't know what I want to do so let's let's test my flight right and that that becomes a de facto horror mechanic in a a sense uh stress mechanic I should say right which Um, which 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 kind of makes up a lot of horror games out there a lot of people feel right some type of stress mechanic and, and way to adjudicate that uh, so the, the, the authors of this game, uh, which I haven't yet mentioned, mm-hmm. but um, 
Jonathan Gilmore and Doug uh, Lewandowski. I think I said that right. It's published by Hunters Entertainment. And also, I think it was distributed by Renegade Games. Uh, these guys have done a fantastic job. They, they're super supportive of the game. They put out, uh, Hunters puts out a free content Friday, first Friday of every mm-hmm. month. And it's stuff to support this game. Could be scenarios, uh, settings, tips and tricks. Uh, it also supports some of their other games that use the same Kids on Bikes engine. Right. Uh, that just just goes to speak to its adaptability. You want to play Harry Potter, you, they got that version too. Mm-hmm. I think they got a Supers version they're working on. So, I mean, it's yeah, kids, Teens in Space. Kids on Brooms, Teens in Space, um, you know. and Kids in Capes, I think. Oh, okay. Well... Yeah, I think it's yeah. I just uh, n- I, never mind. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but I th- but I think it's a supers game. Right. But that that speaks to its adaptability. So again, not expressly horror, but absolutely you can you can twist it, meld it, mold it into a horror game, or as much horror as little uh, horror as you want. Right. I mean, yeah, because you know a, a lot of the '80s tropes, even though they're considered quote unquote horror adjacent games, it, it's right. it's a lot of you know dramatic tension, like. I mean, yeah, you could take this to, like, Crystal Lake. Mm-hmm. You could take it to, um, you know, Scooby-Doo. It could be, it could, or, Goonies, you know. Goonies is one. Yeah, Goonies. Or you could take it to just, you know, really bad big hair. I mean, right. it, it can run the gamut here. So, right. great game. I've played it a bunch of times. I've run it a bunch of times. Mm-hmm. Absolutely love it every time I do it. All right, I'm going to pass the Rubik's Cube snake back to you. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to twirl it around like I did when I was five years old and then never touch the damn thing again. So, um, True story. Speaking of games uh, that aren't necessarily, their focus is not, you know, horror, terror, uh, you know, and, and that kind of thing, but uh, can be easily mod- modified to that. And, and, you know, a lot of its contents revolve around a lot of horror tropes and this game is going is called Liminal. Uh, Liminal is a game by Paul uh, Michener by uh, uh, I believe his his publishing company is Wordplay Games, distributed and by Modifius, which is where you can find a copy of it. Um, likewise, other places like Drive Through, and I believe there's you can you could get copies on Amazon. But anyways, uh, back to the game itself. Uh, what Liminal is, it's it's probably what I would throw under the urban fantasy setting uh it takes place primarily in the uk uh around you know areas such as london and whatnot Uh, a lot of the character classes that are going to be in this game are going to be what you would consider to be urban fantasy uh, things that deal with with fairies things that deal with magicians and magic but then it's vampires get thrown in there werewolves get thrown in there i mean even even areas of the realm that deal with the fae you know, there's there's a lot of people who kind of who feel like things that do with fairies should be horror because they can be mean little buggers. Oh yeah, the traditional traditional <laughs> you know uh, fairy tales. You know, fairies weren't you know cutesy little things with wings. They were vicious little creatures that only wanted to torment you and torture you. And and, and when they were bored, they'd kill you. So the game itself, liminal, uh, it's one of those where similar to kids on bikes you can make it whatever you want you can make it this this urban fantasy game such as uh, neil gaiman's neverwhere um, you can make it horror centric like a lot of the you know the vampire games and whatnot it's so pliable and moldable and just modifiable that you can take it and do whatever you want with it it's wonderfully simple it's just a basic 2d6 system where you can add any sort of skill bonuses you have to it or take away from it you know in addition to that you know a lot of the a lot of love and support has been thrown into this um it is widely supported by its authors uh and but also very open to a lot of the community who love liminal such as myself and it is even though it's very uk and british centric not only can it be picked up and put somewhere else, it's recommended in aspects of the book. You know, make liminal your own, uh, which you know I've I've done. You know, one of one of my goals is I've you know trying to move it over to the United States. I've created a you know an adventure myself that takes place in New Orleans. I'm going to try to move it over to Los Angeles, and very similar to you know Dark Places and Demigorgons, you know a lot of the focus is on local folklore and horror aspects that exist here. Uh, that may not necessarily, you know, that are different, but still a connectivity to it 
to our UK roots uh, before we sever those ties by throwing all of the tea into the uh, <laughs> into the water. But you know, we'll 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 debate that on another pub night again. You know, Just call me. A, oh yeah, yeah, traitor, whatever. Uh, but <laughs> but but no, it, and 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 I mean, and this this may be kind of like you know more personal things. I've gotten to know you know Doctor Mitch over this past year and a half, and have played with him in several different games, and currently probably speak with him at least once a week. So. Am I biased? Of course. You know, most of these games that I, I recommend, I, I'm biased. It's, I'm a DCC f- freak. I, you know, I love Dark Places and Demogorgons because it, you know, the area it takes place in, I'm intimate with because that's where family lives, and and I like Liminal because I like the author that that's conceived it. Uh, so yeah, right. But they're all, but but all the recommendations thus far are just damn good. games. Exactly. On, on top of it all, you know, I, I I'm not you know recommending it just because you know. Not my son created it, and you know we definitely want Billy to you know take notice because you know it's a beautiful crayon drawing he did. No, this is <laughs> the, the the these are games that you know are worthy of your support, and it just makes it a plus that they're created by good people and have a good game supporting it too, as far as mechanic right. wise. But uh, but yeah, but Liminal can be as light. And airy and fey like, um, in you know, in a dreamlike state, or as horrific and dark and terrifying as you want it to be, uh, because it provides you with all of those tools, all of the tropes, and without overcomplicating it with a lot of rules, and likewise overcomplicating it with a giant lore dump. I mean, there's enough there for you to play with, but you you don't have to sit down and you know have Bud from you know Bud RPG Review test you on it. To see if you're understanding the, uh, you know, the the 45 years of Glorantian lore, you know, this this you, oh, I know, it, right? Liminal is a small book. It's probably very similar to, uh, uh, you know, Kids on Bikes and Town yep. Hall Malice. Yep. It's digest size and easily transportable, and you can read it in one sitting. If you sat down and just had, you know, a couple hours, you could breeze right through it. Yeah, it's a great read. I, I have it. I own it. I love it mm-hmm. too. So and, and looking forward to more, <coughs> Doctor Mitch. Uh, hint, hint. You know, I, I believe the Werewolves of London is supposed to be out any day now. We'll, yeah, very soon. We'll, I we'll hear. probably come out as soon as um, you know the uh, um, RuneQuest starter set is announced. But whatever, we'll we'll, we'll deal with points of Ouch. contention on on another episode. Ouch. Uh, but uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, but but anyway, so so yeah, those those are going to be my three offerings that uh, you know people should check out if they're looking for alternatives to you know you know some of the bigger you know, horror games that, uh, that, that are out there. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap it up with my third, but I'm going to take it a little darker. So this game, I'm not going to mention the name yet. Mm -hmm. It is meant to be played in the dark with tea light candles. 10 candles to be precise are lit and placed around the table. Uh, the game is called 10 candles. Oh, shoot. I was thinking of another game that starts with the T the tingle verse. No, no, that's a different horror. <laughs> um, that's for a whole nother special episode. But no, uh, Ten Candles. Uh, it's written by Stephen Dewey of Calvary Games. Mm-hmm. It is a fantastic game. So yes, as I said, it's meant to be played in the dark with these ten tea lights. Everybody is super interactive. Everything is player led. Everything about the narrative is player led. The game master really only kind of sets a scene. And then lets the players run with it. Players decide whatever it is they want to do. The GM at that point only intercedes and when, if and when the players, well, eventually when the players make a decision that they want to do something that that maybe barge through a door and to see if there's zombies on the other side, right? Or this thing, or if there's supplies on the other side, because they have a mission. They're trying to get somewhere to, to get out of this situation they're in. And so the game master at that point will say, okay, roll your dice. And it's a, it's a pass fail game, uh, but it's a dwindling dice pool. Uh, at some point player dice shift to the game master uh, and the game master will roll against them, but it's not to take away from them, but it's who gets to narrate the outcome. They get to narrate whatever it is that was trying to be achieved, but they get to put their spin on it, whether it's the game master or the players. So, but it is designed to be a freeform game. I've seen it run as a freeform game. That's how I tend to play Mm -hmm. it. But I've also seen a stellar example of it uh, being run as a more traditional game master led game. Okay. 
uh, where the players are, the story is told by the game master in, in more of a traditional sense where the players interact more in that traditional sense. So it has some adaptability. Oh, I, I could totally see, see it be utilized as something like from a, um, uh, like a Tales from the Crypt, where there's like a crypt keeper and who is kind of right. pseudo adjudicating it, but it's the people filling in the right. story. Yep. So, um, but big story premise is it's the world's gone dark. There's this alien type thing that exists out there. That is your only saving grace is as long as you have light. And uh, if, if you go without light as a character in the game, you run the risk of dying, which ends up happening at the game. It's a tragic horror game. Everybody's going to die at the end of the right, game. Right, right. Or disappear in, in Nobody really knows what happens to them when they disappear, right. but assume death. But as the game is played in the physically in the dark in a dark space, and the candles get extinguished either because of the mechanics of the game, which are super simple, mm-hmm. or somebody accidentally like waves their hand too hard, puff of air too much, and a candle extinguishes, that ends a scene, and that means it's one less candle lit. When you're down to one candle, that's the final scene. Right. And the game ends when that last candle is put out. Uh, it is fantastic. You can tell some crazy stories. There's like 10 scenario frameworks in the, in the book, but you can make them up like super easy to create your Mm -hmm. own. So Hmm. excellent game. Uh, it's not available on drive through. You actually have to go to, uh, Calvary games website Mm -hmm. and order from, uh, directly from the publisher, Mm -hmm. but it's in print. It's in PDF or a combo pack. And it's, it's a great game. I, I, Super awesome. I've seen it out in the wild. I mean, it's rare, but it's usually there's a small, you know, a couple games nearby have like a kind of small, what I call their indie section. Of just, right. You know, yeah. Someone may have picked it up. Uh, you know, someone may have kickstarted something and it's just part of and it. A lot of those things never really get looked at, uh, but uh, it, that falls into the category that in like Dread and, and games like that just kind of sit there until someone recommends it. Uh, because if I'm not mistaken, yeah. the game itself is just it's just words on white paper, right? There's not really any. It's not inundated yeah. with with you know graphics. It's not inundated with artwork. No, there's just uh, there's a there's a small sampling of graphics mm-hmm. in it. You know, art pieces, right. black and white art, full color, dark tone, black and like maroons and yellows on the you know full art cover, mm-hmm. wraparound cover. But it's a soft soft cover digest yeah. book. But it's 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 black copy on white paper, mm-hmm. uh, easy to read, nice layout. You can actually read it quite quickly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, great game. Uh, but those are my three recommendos, mm-hmm. and Scott's got his three. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we've uh, excited you uh, to to go check out something new, uh, especially with the holidays coming. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. uh, whether it's Halloween or it's Christmas or Yule or Hanukkah or whatever it is you celebrate at the end of the year. It's a great time to get together with friends, family, and play some games, even if it's a horror game. Well, there you go. I think it's time to stick a sacrificial knife into this episode, grab our brooms, head to the darkest corner of the pumpkin patch, and await the arrival of the Great Pumpkin. So I'm not getting paid for this. Well, I think that kind of wraps up our uh, episode two. Oh, of do we Titter have to Pigs. end it so soon? Well, we have stuff to do. I have a Halloween costume. I got to go pretend that I can still fit into. I've got to go buy candy that I'm going to promise I'm not going to touch until Halloween, and that lie is going to oh, last about five hours. I, I do apples and razor blades. Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, I'm so, a horrible person. Uh, they they did say they, they they found the Zodiac Killer today. They officially announced it. So is anyone knocking at your door in the next few minutes? Um, nope. Not yet. All <laughs> not right. Yet. Well, well, I got to see how much it, that uh, that bounty is, and I may just you know send them <laughs> your way. Uh, but yeah, so we I think we we had a we, you know we had a good discussion uh, about the uh, about um, you know agency within horror games. Uh, I think we gave it a good treatment, uh, but you know it's something that you know we're, we weren't here to solve the puzzle of it to, to make a definite you know answer as to can horror 
you know, exist without it in a role playing game or not. Uh, we just gave our general opinion and, yep. you know, it's up to our listeners to decide. Right. But I think, I think the bigger question is, did we stimulate, like we said in the intro, did we stimulate a bigger, broader, wider conversation? Yeah. So hopefully our listeners will tell us that uh, either on social media, on all the various social media sites that, um, that we, we, you know, throw the, the links out on, or they'll, they'll go over to anchor the anchor website and hit the message button and record us a message. That would be great. That would be great. Tell us, tell us, did we stimulate a conversation? Did you think differently? Are we, are we completely off base? That's cool. Tell us. Do we have any business talking about this shit at all? Tell Um, us. (laughs) Exactly. Tell us. Help steer us in the new directions. Right. Uh, So with that, um, you know, other than, you know, sticking uh, foreign objects and fruit, uh, are you doing anything gaming wise for Halloween? Uh, Probably not. I got a lot of work stuff coming up. Uh, It's I'm I'm struggling just to to run my regular games, let alone Mm -hmm. anything else. So probably not. What's what's in your in your wheelhouse there for for Halloween? Anything? Uh, nothing specific on Halloween itself, but that Friday prior, the 29th, I believe it is, uh, my friend Darren, who runs Critical Hit Games in uh, Corona, California, uh, if you live locally, go check it out. It's a great store. Uh, uh, he's going to have a, a nighttime event. Uh, after the store officially closes at 8, a lot of the uh, uh, his favorite customers and myself are going to be uh, having a little Halloween soiree, so to speak. Uh, I'm jealous. Uh, yeah. Oh no, it's it's going to be fun. Uh, a small event, uh, but there'll be a few people there running games. I'm hoping someone will run ten candles. Uh, oh, I hope as- for your sake somebody does. Uh, yeah, I mean, or dread, or, or one of the other just alternatives to your standard, you know, uh, uh, you know, RPG game. But which is what I'm going to be running is uh, a, a little game that you may be familiar with. Um, you know, it's a Call of Cthulhu game. It is a, a Halloween, uh, you know, centric game. It's, and I believe it's called the, the Dur. Um, I mean, you, you had part of this, you edited it, right? The correct pronunciation of the title is not the Dur. Oh, okay. Well then maybe the editor needs to do a better job. Oh, okay. I need glasses. Sorry. It's, it's the Dare. Yes. Would Uh, you like to borrow my glasses? (laughs) Yes. It's called the Dare. The, the the dare um, I've never run this before it comes highly recommended I mean you being part of its uh, of its you know creation as uh, you know one of the uh, proofreading editors probably intimately and in, uh, you know knowledgeable of this game but uh, very much so sounds like a fantastic game uh, you know it's it's uh, by by Kevin Ross uh, with uh, uh, Kramer McLean McKinnis, and Inglehart yep uh, all all great folks that do some fantastic work yeah I Hands down, it's it's a great scenario playing kids in the 1980s. Yeah, yeah. In a, in a haunted house, and it's kind of you know brings back you know the you know, evokes a lot of the horror movies of, of our youth. You know that involve kids like that. Um, yep. Uh, or even even the movie. I mean, there's the movie The House. There's the uh, the Gate. There's um, I can't remember all of them. It's oh unrolled. yeah, but it but it's very <laughs> apropos for for running as as a Halloween game. I, I as an admin on on a bunch of social media sites mm-hmm. uh, that deal with Call of Cthulhu or horror you know genre stuff. That is one of them that uh, one of the scenarios that gets recommended regularly this time of year for mm-hmm. uh, you know hey I need a one shot for Halloween. Run the dare right. So it's and- it's a great game. So hopefully I'll I'll be able to touch base on how everything went on uh, on episode three and kind of give everyone an idea of uh, maybe some thoughts on the game and just you know if you know how it went yeah you know, it's it's uh, fantastic it, and see how many because it's it's going to be a full I mean it's I don't know if I'll have enough for all of the the pre gens but there's going to be at least four or five people that are going to be with within the game so it should be a good time Looking I think everybody will it. have a good time I do excellent excellent so so yeah. Um, Thank you to everyone who has taken the time to come to Titter Pigs to listen to episode two. Uh, we hope we gave you some good recommendations uh, as far as some some of the games that we, we we've offered out. Uh, you know, hopefully, as you know, Keith mentioned that uh, our personal conversation has you know uh, created some of your own, um, and hopefully, you're not gathering pitchforks and torches. 
uh, after these conversations are, are evoked. But if you but are, I know a few places I can point you at. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just remember, we're all in this hobby together, regardless of you know our personal opinions and and uh, afflictions within them. Everyone has a way they enjoy the games, and everyone has their own opinions on how games. Uh, or how they themselves enjoy the games. You know, one person's horror is not another person's horror. True story. Uh, but, the, but more importantly, that we all are aware of that and, you know, allow people to enjoy things that the way they want to, and hopefully that gets returned back to us. So anything else before we, we close? Uh, uh, yeah, I would like mm-hmm. to throw out, we have a new uh, outbound segment just beyond this one. I'd like everybody to take a listen. It's called Your Side of the Mic. It's... It's going to be something we include with every episode from now on moving forward. Uh, this is an opportunity that we're, we're extending to you to call in via our Anchor website and record us a message in response to specific questions. Uh, so this episode has a specific question that we're going to uh, ask you to to call in and give us your response. We're going to curate a few of those those recordings, and then we're going to put those in on episode three on the tail end, of, and then we're going to ask a new question on episode three. Sometimes it'll just be, hey, a gee whiz question like this month is. Sometimes it could be we're doing a little little research for a future topic that we're going to include on Titter Pigs, and mm-hmm. you'll, you will and be part of that, that conversation mm-hmm. via your recordings to us and your responses. So it's called Your Side of the Mic, and we do encourage everybody to listen through it. Uh, it's not very long, and then we we want you to you know to go to anchor.fm slash titterpigs. You know, leave us a message. Yeah, we'd absolutely. appreciate it. And and any heavy breathers, that's for Keith. Um, I love it. <laughs> we'll curate those for a different segment. Uh, but but yes. So so thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to to any calls that we get. Uh, be they be they responses to the questions or even just 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 praise and love you know just telling us how wonderful we are the wonderful people that we are and how great we're doing uh in in this little project that we have going on and of course and if there's any negative comments they they will be deleted uh the computer i listen to them on will be burned and we will find you uh one way or another um (laughs) so with that We're going to wrap this up. Now it's on to you to listen to your side of the mic, and we'll see you in episode three. See you later. This is our Your Side of the Mic segment, where your thoughts and opinions are an important part of the conversation, too. In each episode, we ask a game-related question and invite you to leave us a recorded message. Who knows? Maybe we'll play back your message on a future show. Recording a message is easy. Just visit anchor.fm slash titterpigs. Click the message button and record your comment. You can also do this directly through the Anchor app. Please try to keep it short and on topic. Tell us your name or handle and your location, along with your response to this show's question. Happy gaming! And, with this being the Halloween season, how could we not ask, what's your go-to horror RPG and why? We're curious, so tell us. Trick or treat!